invite you to turn in your Bibles to James chapter 1 as we continue in our study in the book of James here this morning. Remember as we're um, studying this book that we, maybe I should speak for myself, um, I have come to be inclined at least to believe that this was likely James, the brother of Jesus, who wrote this. Some of the things we're going to be looking at this morning actually show something of a relationship between James and his mother, who was also Mary, and James's brother, Jesus, who was sent, of course, to die for our sins. And the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is very related to James himself, who would have been a half-brother of the Lord Jesus, of course, with Jesus being the firstborn and born of the Holy Spirit, and then James being a son of Mary as well. The birth of Jesus would have been a, a, a huge thing for James, and yet, interestingly, as we began this study, we realized that for a number of years, uh, James did not believe, along with other members of his family. So just having Jesus born into the family was, was not enough. They actually needed the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit in helping them to believe in their Savior, not just live with their brother. Well, this morning, we're focusing on James 1, 9 through 11, uh, an eternal perspective on temporal circumstances. But let me back up and put it in context. I'm going to go ahead and read starting from the beginning of the chapter, James 1, 1. And if you're using a pew Bible, this is on page 1386. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass, its flower falls, and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. Let's pray. Our Father, as we come before your word this morning, we ask that you would give us this eternal perspective on our temporal circumstances. Oftentimes, we don't really understand what's going on and why, but by faith, Lord, we believe you, we trust you, and we know that much of what happens in this life with its tribulations and its difficulties will give way to the, the ultimate fullness of joy that we experience in glory. But help us, Lord, when it comes to those areas where particularly we're called to live by faith, not really knowing why or how or often even what, but Lord, help us to, to exercise faith, to live by faith in you, our, our triune God, that you are working in us to do your good purposes and that even the difficulties that come to us come from the hands of a loving Heavenly Father. That is the truth for all of us who know you. And we're thankful for that. And we pray, Lord, that you would continue to teach us to live by faith and to view our earthly circumstances with an eternal perspective. Help us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, imagine that you're part of a family in a community of Jewish Christ followers living far away from Israel, the kind of people that James is writing. Your whole life 
You have seen your family and your friends struggle to make ends meet because you're foreigners living in a land where you're considered to be an outsider. The language people speak around you is not the language you grew up speaking in your family. Rich and powerful people tend to take advantage of you because they can, and it's often how they make their money. You have to take the menial jobs, the jobs of manual labor, where you don't make much money and you're doing everything that you can just to scrape things together to make ends meet. And you've seen your neighbors hauled into court and falsely accused, but they didn't really have much protection and justice was not realized. And some of the people taking advantage of the poor in your community are from your own community. But they're the people who have found their way to make money and exert power even amongst their fellow Jewish brethren. And on top of all of that, those who despise you blaspheme the precious name of Jesus, attacking your faith and trying to bring shame to your Lord. And then you get James's letter. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Those trials that you're going through on a daily basis because of your heritage and often because of your faith and because of where you live and who you happen to be, put those trials, James says, in the category of pure joy. How? Why? Because, James says, you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. These very trials, these very difficult circumstances that you and your family and your friends are living day by day throughout your lives, these very trials are used of God to purify you and cultivate your hope in Christ. And in the process, your faith is shown to be genuine. You're reminded that God is continuing his good work in you and that God is orchestrating these trials for a greater purpose, including your good. As God works perseverance into your life, James says, God's grace will be developing the character of Christ in you, bringing you to a measure of maturity and completeness and trust in your walk with Jesus. So instead of, like many in the world do, instead of yielding to anger and despair and violence because of your poor treatment, godly wisdom is available to those who ask God for it. Wisdom which bears the fruit of justice and love and peace. But James says this peace and joy is for those who pursue Jesus with all of their hearts. If you give your heart over to the pursuit of money in an idolatrous fashion, or if your heart is bent on destroying your enemies who have mistreated you, don't expect God to answer the prayer for wisdom. You cannot serve God and money. Don't expect to receive wisdom from God when you are living in rejection of him and bypassing the very means he has provided for getting that wisdom. So every day, James is saying, in the midst of all of those trials, cling to the promises of his word, cling to God's goodness, Believe that he is faithful no matter what. And then conduct yourself as if those things were true. Because they are. Now in our text today in verses 9 through 11, James continues with this theme of testing and encourages the Jews who were poor and oppressed to see their circumstances through the eyes of faith. He's really introducing a significant theme of his letter. How should believing Jews struggle to make a living, I'm sorry, struggling to make a living, respond to the temptations that come from oppression? 
And we'll see as we continue on in the study of the book of James that James comes back to that a couple of different times fairly substantially. How can Christ following Jews who are being oppressed by others in a, often in a foreign land respond to the temptations that come from that oppression? It's right where they lived. So in our text this morning, verses 9 through 11, really there are the two things clearly that, that James is discussing. Uh, first of all, the ex- exaltation of the lowly brother and the humiliation of the rich. He says in verse 9, let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation. This lowly brother is really any believer, brother or sister, member of the family of God. Particularly, James was writing the Jews who had been scattered abroad. This lowly brother is a believer living in humble circumstances, or lowly, or we could even say despicable circumstances. They were struggling. They didn't have a lot. They didn't have a lot, not only by way of possession, but by way of social capital. They didn't have a lot of power. They didn't have the same resources that other people in the country would have had. They were living in humble or lowly situations. Now, this was actually not all that uncommon, was it, in Jewish history? The Jews had often lived in difficult circumstances, um, oppressed by other nations, for instance, like Egypt. Uh, Remember after Joseph brought his family down to Egypt and then Israel began to grow there and and grow much more numerous and actually scared Pharaoh? And they were oppressed. They were. They were mistreated there. And, And some of them murdered until eventually they ended up exodusing, leaving that nation. But then as they left there and they make their way to the land that God gave them, uh, nation after nation, it seemed like there was always someone who was after them, always where the Jews found themselves in a weak position or outnumbered or outpowered, partly so that God could show his strength in them, but it was very much a part of their history. They often lived in difficult circumstances. Now, if you move forward, you remember that ultimately... Not only do you go through the time of the judges, which was a time of great difficulty with surrounding nations coming and attacking, but then eventually the northern kingdom of Assyria went into captivity, and then the southern kingdom of of Judah, I'm sorry, the northern kingdom of Israel went into captivity with Assyria, the southern kingdom of Judah went into captivity with Babylon, and that might even be the backdrop for some of these scattered Christ followers who were Jewish. Their story is the story of difficult circumstances. There's actually even a a Hebrew word that has kind of become a term somewhat synonymous with those who are lowly and even those who are lowly and yet a faithful remnant waiting for Christ. I don't know if you've heard the term anawim. The anawim is a Hebrew word from the Old Testament referring to the lowly or to the poor ones. People like Mary, the mother of Jesus and James. People like James, ministering in Jerusalem, but ministering to many oppressed Jews. You could even say Jesus himself, a man who had no place to lay his head, (laughs) would have fit this category. But people like this, who were the lowly ones or the poor ones, were known as the Anawim the faithful remnant who continued to trust Jehovah and wait for his promises even when they were called to live through times of great difficulty. Turn back with me for a moment to Luke chapter 1. I actually already read this as the call to worship this morning, but I want you to go back and look again with me at Mary's song. Matthew, Mark, Luke, Luke chapter 1, verse 46 The idea of being lowly was actually quite synonymous in many situations with being a faithful Jewish um, remnant who was waiting 
for the promises of God to be fulfilled. And you see this uh, not only in the way James couches his language in our text, but James' mother, remember now, in Luke chapter 1, I mean, we think of her as the mother of Christ, but also now the mother of James. So think of it like this. What we're about to read was sung by a woman who's the mother of the author of our text. Now, I won't read the whole thing again. I did that in in the uh, call to worship. But I want you to notice what is really some very common imagery in Israel about um, exaltation and humiliation. It's very common terminology because of Israel's history. For instance, look at verse 48. Mary sings, For Jehovah, he has regarded the lowly state of his hand or his maidservant for behold henceforth all generations will call me blessed you see the pattern there mary says i am lowly i am a maidservant living in a lowly state i'm not a prominent person i'm not a wealthy or powerful person i am a a maidservant living in a lowly state and by the way that's the same word there as what James uses in verse 9 of our text. Let the brother of low degree, or let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation. It's the same, same word. Probably heard his mom say it growing up. She sings, for God has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant, but all generations will call me blessed, which implies a form of exaltation. So God is going to take her from being in a position of lowliness and humility to being in a position of being blessed. So this this theme of God exalting the lowly and bringing down the haughty is a very common theme in Scripture. Now let me pause just a moment because this is going to be a common theme all throughout. Let me just get this out of the way. Having a lot of money in and of itself, the scriptures teach, does not make you innately evil. There were men and women of God throughout the Bible who had a lot of resources, and at times they used it in tremendous ways for God's kingdom. You can think everybody from Abraham to Lydia in the New Testament, who seemed to have been a woman of means. Having the money is not the issue. Just like money is... not the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. Having money is not in and of itself sinful, but it it became so synonymous for rich people to abuse others because in their unconverted hearts it was so, so common that I think it was kind of like, you know how sometimes the Bible refers to the Gentiles more as a lifestyle than a nationality or an an identity, ethnic identity. So for instance, um, there were Gentiles who were told not to live like the Gentiles because the, uh, the general common way that Gentiles lived was godless and wicked, so don't live like the Gentiles. I think in a similar sense, at times, the rich so often abuse their money and their power and their status that at times it's just kind of synonymous with the rich, with the implication being those who have a love for money and a disdain for God will be brought low. And so you see those themes running through our text today. Well, in the song that Mary sings, I'll look down at verse um, 50, let's see here, 52. And notice again the theme of taking down what is up and making up, you know, pushing up what comes down. 52 says, God, he has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. Now, it's interesting that Mary sings this kind of thing, but it was a a fairly significant theme in Israel's history because they had been so often oppressed by others. There was a remnant of those who, yeah, they were poor, and they were calling out to God, waiting upon his promises, his prophecies to be fulfilled, waiting for the deliverer to come. 
And part of the theme related to those things was the sovereignty of God in exalting the lowly and taking down the haughty, especially those who had come against him. So in our text, in James 1 and verse 9, James uses this word that is found in Mary's song. Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation. And this idea of being poor um, really describes how things were for them socially, economically. They, they didn't have a lot of relationship capital, you know, friends in high places. They were despised because of who they were and where they were. And they didn't have a lot of money. So this lowliness is not just being low on money, it's being in a humiliating circumstance. You don't have enough money to live, and people around you look down on you. So there's a theme in Mary's song, as well as here in our text, of reversal. This theme of reversal that God lifts up the humble and takes down the haughty. So James says, let the lowly brother glory or boast in his exaltation. Now sometimes when I study a passage, I guess like a lot of us, I come into it with certain ideas, certain understandings, things I've always kind of always believed. I don't know that what I've believed about this passage has been wrong, but I think that there is um, a measure of specificity to it. In other words, people often view this exaltation as things like this. Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation. Okay, you are despised in the eyes of the world. You don't have a lot of money. You're going through a lot of tribulation. So what do you do? How do you, how do you glory in your exaltation. And a lot of times the thinking goes like this, and this isn't wrong, but I think James is probably being more specific than this. We often think of things like this. I know that I have been reconciled with God, that I'm a child of the King, that I have great riches in Jesus Christ, and that I'm headed for a sinless and sadless eternity. I know that's not a word, but it should be. It means without sad. <laughs> now, those things are all true for a believer, and they're glorious, and I'm not trying to diminish those things. But James is probably emphasizing something more specific and related to their current situation. The poor Jewish believer is lifted up or is exalted when he learns to see his economic trials as a part of God's work in his life, like James exhorted them previously in the text. When the poor Jewish believer sees how God is bringing him to maturity through those trials, when he sees God cultivating wisdom into their lives along with its accompanying peace and gentleness, When you're able to look at the circumstances all around you and those trials that you're going through and see in them God at work, like we preached previously, that might be specifically what James is referring to. And so those of you who are lowly in despicable circumstances can glory in the exaltation of when I look around, you think you're hurting me, you think you're taking advantage of me, you think you've got me under your thumb, but God is continuing to do his work in my life and he's using your sin to do it. Similar to what we read in Romans 5, therefore having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also 
glory in tribulations. We boast, we exult in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. Same things James said. And perseverance, character, and character, hope. And remember, the hope of the scriptures is a settled assurance of what's to come, not some kind of a wish. So even though the wicked hearts of men may be trying to take advantage of the Jewish believers, what their actions actually did was accomplish the purposes of God in their lives, and those lowly brothers and sisters are exalted, are lifted up. Now, I want to talk for a, a minute about the, just the concept of being poor, because that theme is a common theme in Scripture. In fact, a moment ago, we, we sang some of it around the idea of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are different ways of being poor. Um, kids, are you, are you with me here? So I think one of, the, one of the ways of being poor is not having enough money. Now, the more that we move away from cash, the less this might mean in years to come. But one of the universal signs of being poor that I grew up with was this right here. You take your pockets, you pull them inside out, and you show that there's nothing in there. I don't, and then that's the universal sign for I don't have any money. I'm poor. That's one kind of being poor. There might be another kind of poor where you have difficult circumstances and bad relationships going on in your life. Let's say, for instance, kids, um, how many of you kids have a younger brother or sister? Okay. Have you ever had one of those younger brothers or sisters kind of burp and spit up all over your new outfit for the day? Uh-huh, uh-huh, I figured there'd be some, yeah, okay, that were brave enough to admit it. Now, when that spit up is all on your outfit, dripping down onto the floor, you might say something like, poor me, why me? Now, that doesn't relate so much to your finances, but to your circumstances and your relationships. There are different ways of being poor. There is one really important way of being poor that is kind of related to this because it's related to what Jesus taught the Jews. And we've already seen that James himself um, clearly had an understanding of the Sermon on the Mount and of the Beatitudes. His teaching parallels much of what Christ taught. Well, in those Beatitudes, in Matthew 5, 3, Jesus taught, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, there's a third kind of poor. You have poor, I don't have any money. You have poor me, I have bad circumstances and relationships. And then you have poor in spirit. But it's really important because Jesus said that the poor in spirit would have the kingdom of heaven. And we've preached on this at least a couple of different times through the years. The idea here is that when God brings us to the end of ourselves and we realize that we can't earn our salvation or merit favor with him in, a, in that relationship with him, when we are brought low by recognizing our own sin and recognizing our own need, we're poor in spirit. You see, the rich... People who are rich and then arrogant at the same time, and again, not just because they have things, but those who are godless and rich come to God, come to that relationship, and they think they have what they need. Because I have money, because I have gifts, because I have people, friends in high places, because I have power, because I have all these resources, I'm good to go. And somebody like that, you start talking to them about God, and they think they have the righteousness they need. They think they can do it. Now, it isn't so much related to just finances, because in God's grace, there are people with a lot of money who do become poor in spirit. 
But what they have to recognize is that, you know what, no matter what I have in earthly goods, think of what the Apostle Paul said about all of the heritage that he had, all of the things that he had, and yet he had to count it all as dung when it came to his relationship with God. God can even take a rich person in this world's goods and make them poor in spirit by helping them to understand that they need a righteousness that is not their own, that they need the righteousness of Christ. And being poor in spirit means you recognize I'm a sinner deserving of hell, lost and under God's wrath by nature, and the only answer to that problem is to humble myself in repentance and faith, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And you see, one of the reasons that people like Mary or James or others could be considered to be blessed as the the Anoim, those who were the lowly ones who were waiting for Christ or waiting for his promises to be fulfilled, was not just because they were poor in this world's goods. There are plenty of rebels against God who have nothing of this earth's goods. Just being poor does not make you holy. But see, here's what it was. You have people like Mary and and others who James was writing to people who were struggling. Yes, they may have been low in money. They may have been low in relationship and human circumstances. But those things alone did not make them holy or gain them favor with God. It was being poor in spirit, which is sometimes related to those other things. Sometimes God uses the adverse circumstances of life to humble people and make them see their need. But whether someone is rich or is poor in this world's goods, the important thing in our relationship with God is to be poor in spirit recognizing our need, recognizing that we really are spiritually beggars at God's table. Everything that we need comes from Him. Everything that we need, spiritually speaking, comes from Him. So you think about, um, even while we were singing that song, if you thought I was messaging, I was not. I was getting the lyrics to that song that we just sang. So I thought, what a, what a great connection to what we were talking about here. You know, Jesus, literally, we're told in Colossians, is the creator of the universe. And theologians talk about his humiliation when he not only took upon himself the form of a human, but actually died the death of a horrible criminal. Jesus came all the way from glory, from heaven, not just to humanity on earth, but dying in our place as a condemned criminal. And so when we talk about Jesus being born in a manger, being born in a lowly fashion, it is striking that the king of all glory was humbled in that way. We just sang this, fullness of grace in man's human frailty. This is the wonder of Jesus. Laying aside his power and glory, humbly he entered our world. He didn't stop being God, but he laid aside some of that power and glory in order to become human and live as he did with us. Chose the path of meanest worth. That means he was lowly. Scandal of a virgin birth means He had a bad reputation. Their family had a cloud hanging over it, at least in the eyes of some, because Mary had Jesus before she was with Joseph. Born in a stable, cold, and rejected, here lies the hope of the world. You know, Jesus identifies with the lowly because he was made lowly so that he could exalt his people with salvation. Then, of course, Jesus didn't stay in the grave. He rose from the grave. He ascended back into heaven. And so theologians talk not only about his humiliation, but his exaltation back to the glory of the position that he had before he came to this earth. 
But here is an important point. As we're thinking about the exaltation of the lowly, think about how really that's the description of our salvation. The exaltation of the lowly. Those of us dead in trespasses and sins made sons and daughters of the king through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, James talks about the exaltation of the lowly brother, and then he moves to the second thing here in the text, the end of, or in verse 10. Let the lowly brother uh, glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation. Because as a flower of the field, he will pass away. Now, this is something that uh, I'm not sure if you've, seen this before or not, or if you even thought about this, but there's actually a lot of debate here that affects some of the meaning of what James is trying to say, trying to decide whether that this rich person is a believer or an unbeliever. And I'll just say right now, the scholars are fairly evenly divided on the matter. James does not use the same word that he does at first. He talks about the lowly brother, But then he just refers to the rich. I'm not going to get deep into all of this, but let me just say this. Either way, there is truth to be understood. If this is referring to a believer, that the rich person is someone who is a Christ follower, that he should glory in his humiliation, there is, I think, something of uh, the book of Proverbs here, of wisdom literature, in the kind of the sarcasm and the irony that James seems to be using here in this text. If James is referring to a believer when he refers to the rich here, then the concept would be that our identification with Christ actually brings shame in the eyes of the world. And in that sense we will be brought low. So a rich person who comes to faith in Christ will be brought low by identifying with Christ. And Christ said, (laughs) they didn't like me, they're not going to like you. In this world, you will have much tribulation. And it's possible there might be a reference to the humility of repentance here as well. And if that's what Paul, or what, I'm sorry, James is saying then the scriptures do speak to that idea of those who seem to be rich in this world's goods being made low as they identify with Christ. Now, personally, um, I'm leaning toward the idea that this is probably not a believer Paul is referring to. I I did it again, didn't I? Why did Paul have to write most of the New Testament? And you preach the book of James and you get... Anyway... I think James was saying that this rich person is not a believer, and there are a number of reasons why. Let me just give you a couple of them. First of all, I think the very context to me seems to indicate judgment. I mean, look at it. Verse 10, uh, you know, the, the lowly brother's glorying in his exaltation, but the rich is boasting in his humiliation because as a flower of the field, he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. Now it's possible that's referring to the brevity of life. Because certainly there are times in scripture where the idea of you know, passing like the flowers or the grass is... Um, a a euphemism for the brevity of life. But there seems to be, the in this context, there seems to be almost an implication of of judgment. And later in the letter, um, don't you think James characterizes the rich as unbelievers? Like, for instance, flip over to just chapter 2 there in verse 6. Just maybe a page over if that... Look at what he says in chapter 2 and verse 6. It says, but you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? Now, as I've often said from the pulpit, context is very important. Context is king when it comes to interpreting the scriptures. And in the context of what James is writing in this book, again, he's writing to specific circumstances 
There are believers who have been oppressed by wicked rich people. That's the context. He's not saying all of the rich are wicked, but in this context, it's very specific. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? And he writes that not all that far after he writes verse 10. Those are some of the reasons why it seems like to me James is referring here to a contrast between the exaltation of the believing lowly brother or sister and the humiliation of the unbelieving rich who are oppressing that first group. In my studies this week, there was a, a, one of the men who has written a, common, a commentary on the book of James named Scott McKnight. He offers three possible categories of the rich that might have been very predominant with these lowly Jews. Uh, one category, maybe kind of surprising, the, the priestly establishment. Remember, throughout a lot of Israel's history, there were often religious leaders who are using their position for their own advantage, using whatever resources or finances that came in for their own benefit. And as you trace some of the themes throughout the book of James, uh, some of it seems to point to the possibility of people like priests who could have been taking advantage of their lowly Jewish brethren. And then you can imagine the other categories of the rich in this setting. Uh, Roman rulers, politicians who found ways to pad their own pockets and gain power. And then, in a general sense, people who didn't have to do manual labor. You know, owners or those who ran businesses or enterprises. A large percentage of people in that day would have done manual labor. And often they were the ones who were poor. But if you owned the business or ran the business, if you were one who didn't have to do that manual labor, then you may have also been in that category. Now, I don't, we don't know for sure. I just wanted you to think for a minute about some of the possibilities of who the rich may have been. Well, their humiliation is described actually um, and and warned against, in a sense, by the prophet Jeremiah. Listen to what Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. Now, I see a contrast there. A contrast between a holy God and wicked men who boast in their gifts and in their assets. You have a God who, he says, I delight in exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness. But he contrasts that, it seems to me, with a wise man glorying in his wisdom, a mighty man glorying in his might, and a rich man glorying in his riches. Now again, God does not say that the wisdom or the might or the riches in and of themselves are evil or to be despised, but... They're trouble when you put your heart and your soul and your trust in them. When they are God to you. When they have replaced the one true and living God. And instead of understanding and knowing God and glorying in that, you take hope and confidence and strength and your boast in your wisdom or your might or your riches, which all came from him to begin with. Well, it seems like what Jeremiah, how he ministers here in that text is very similar to what James is saying in his. And again, uh, James, who seems to be uh, familiar with the Proverbs and maybe is using a little bit of irony or sarcasm here, 
He says, boast in your humiliation. He says to the rich, don't boast in your wisdom or your might or your riches, but boast in your humiliation. You boast in your riches, but let me tell you where you're headed if you continue down this path, James says. Because as a flower of the field, he will pass away. For no sooner, verse 11, has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass, its flower falls, and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. While he's doing what he's doing, while he's conducting the business deals that he conducts, it won't be long and he'll be gone. Very similar. There are different passages of Scripture, aren't there? And one of them is Psalm 103 that says similar things. Psalm 103, verse 15 says, As for man, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone. And its place remembers it no more. I read earlier this week, I think it was, you know, because Israel has somewhat of a desert-type climate, it's common for flowers to come out, you know, around February and for a lot of them to be gone by April or May with with the heat, the way the heat is there. So relatively speaking, you know, a few weeks, a couple, two, three months, and it's gone. The heat comes and they disappear. And again, it's kind of that emphasis on the brevity of life and And I think what we have here is really a a warning, James's warning to unbelievers. He says, you glory in your riches. You need to boast in your humiliation. Because your time is short and it will be up soon. And I can't help but think when you look at what James says to rich people later on in his letter that There is a sense of warning there. Maybe it was a warning to some of the rich Jews who were taking advantage of their own people. Maybe, because even as believers, we're tempted towards sin, right? Just like unbelievers sin, our sin can look an awful lot like theirs because we do have sin that remains. It's an ongoing struggle in our sanctification. Maybe James was warning some who had a heart that was being given toward riches. And maybe they weren't really rich yet, but they wanted to be. And maybe they thought, when I get rich, I can be the one who makes other people do what I want them to do. I can be the one with the upper hand. And James is bringing a warning here. And I think he really wants us all to see these temporal circumstances of either being lowly or being rich, whatever your current circumstance seems to be, to view it through the lens of eternity, to to view it through the lens of of the the, the spiritual realm and what it is that is actually happening. And James says, when you get those glasses on, when you look at things through the, the eyes, through the lenses of eternity, you see someone who is rich in the things of this world who is now facing judgment and their earthly life is gone and none of that stuff matters anymore. And you may very well be seeing someone who is despised and lowly in the things of this world as an exalted son or daughter of God. So being able to view today's circumstances through the lens of eternity is part of living by faith. We don't always do it easily and naturally, but it's what James is encouraging us to do. But there is, an unbel- there is a warning here to unbelievers to, to notice that Your riches and your wisdom and your might will not save you. They are quite temporary. And one day as you're going about your business, doing your thing, your life will be over. And what have you done with the Lord Jesus Christ? And how have you gotten ready to face eternity? Important questions and applications for us as we ourselves, by God's grace, try to live our days through the eyes of of the spiritual and the eternal. Let's pray.
Our Father God, it seems like a lot of times we don't naturally think about spiritual things as easily and as quickly as we do about earthly things. That's why you had Paul tell us to set our affections on things above, not on things on the earth. We pray, Lord, that you would teach us as those who follow you and love you and live our lives by faith in you, Lord, that part of living by faith would be that we live in each day's circumstances, whether they're, they're good or not, that we would live each day's circumstances understanding the spiritual and eternal realities of the decisions that we're making and of our relationship with you. Lord, I pray that if there are any with us this morning who are still living in rebellion against you and have not believed on Christ and are not repenting of their sin, Lord, that you would humble them in repentance and draw out their heart, Lord, to see their sin in humility and to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ who can exalt them to an eternity of a home in heaven and a right relationship with the God who made them. Be merciful, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.